Yui back here with my friend Patrick, and we're going to be doing a audio commentary for the first Dirty Harry movie. So if you guys got your own copy of that, you can watch uh, along with us and listen to our uh, thoughts about the film. Or uh, you can just listen to this as a podcast and just hear it like that. We're going to do a countdown and start the movie. And then uh, when we say go, you can uh, watch alongside us. Alrighty. Three, two, one, go. Alrighty. So, so Patrick, what's your relationship with this movie? Well, um, it was on the the background in the background on TV um, for many a uh, holiday and trip home. Um, I uh, was born in San Francisco, uh, like uh, Harry and like Clint Eastwood, actually. And um, oh, really, he was. I had no idea about yeah, that. Yeah, he was, and um, I just love. And initially, I just loved the way the film uses the architecture of the city as uh, as like a character. It was one of the first like c- cities as main character in the film that I, uh, you know, became, uh, you know, that I uh, became intimately aware of as I started, uh, you know, watching this and the sequels and kind of getting more into Eastwood's filmography. And uh, yeah, I just absolutely love um, this establishing tone with the Lalo Schifrin score and uh, um, this, uh, nonverbal interplay between the killer and victim uh in the opening scene here yeah i sequel just knows how to start off the movie right he's like all right no fucking around we're just gonna start with a tense situation just get right into it no dialogue no nothing just pure visual storytelling because i mean this it's interesting that this is his most famous movie because it comes quite later in his career and essentially inaugurates the um I don't know, like the beginning of his late style, you would say. Because uh, like, from what I've seen, his films before this weren't exactly in this manner. Like something changed with this movie and the, the incredible bright colors and the, the dark, moody cinematography and the, the moral ambiguity. He had always kind of had that, but this ratcheted up to another level and just showed that he was essentially like a master craftsman who... He simply could not be fucked with uh, in his era and yeah i mean this is one of the most influential movies of all time uh essentially like i think this is the ground zero for what we know as the american action movie i don't think that really exists before then because you had like aviation movies right you had westerns you had noirs but the idea of like investing in the subjectivity of violence never really quite happened in the way before this came along and like this is a film explicitly about the violence and mayhem of the characters like it's not like it is a character study but it's not like before where it's like okay we'll take a you know the plot of a novel or we'll take this or that like this is you know like kind of a true crimey based off of things that just happened it's um i think it actually it's based off of the same detective that uh like hunted after the zodiac killer which was also the basis for the movie bullet uh with steve mcqueen a couple years earlier and bullet has a lot in common with this i think and like yeah like you take bullet and you take this movie and you essentially have the modern action genre right on um yeah uh siegel had directed uh eastwood in coogan's bluff two meals for his sisters sarah and the beguiled um, and um, before Eastwood uh, signed on, uh, they had already brought it to John Wayne, Frank Sinatra, and Paul Newman. Uh, Newman didn't like the politics. Uh, oh, dude! Of dude Harry. Can you imagine? Can you imagine how bad this film would be with John Wayne? Can you, can you imagine? <laughs> can you imagine? Like, I, I, I don't. I'm not like the biggest John Wayne hater, but like, holy fuck, that would have ruined this movie. Would have. It just would not have worked at all. Well, yeah, because, I mean, um, it's funny. Wayne's biographers at one point said Harry Callahan was John Wayne. And I think what they mean by that is that, um, you know, he was an insane right wing maniac. (laughs) Right. There was nothing. There was no um, nuance to kind of cut against the, uh, you know, this, I guess, yeah, just the right wing uh, cipher of Harry and his actions or whatever. There was nothing 
you know, there's nothing below the surface to really contemplate. Um, so yeah, obviously, um, we're, we're fortunate that they went with Eastwood. Um, and, uh, let's see, John Milius, uh, produced rewrites on the script for this in exchange for a $2,000 gun. Um, filming began April, 1971, uh, released by Christmas, 1971. Um, so very, uh, Quick production by today's standards, certainly. Wait, hold on. This, uh, this was released during Christmas. It was. <laughs> Dude, what a hell of a Christmas movie! Incredible. Can you imagine wanting to see this on Christmas? It's fun yeah, for the whole family. I mean, that's that's my idea of a great Christmas is just hanging out with Quint. Uh, oh, like I know a lot of his movies come out in January now, but like, holy fuck! Like I, I guess just America was different back then. They were like, yeah, yeah, <laughs> holiday season. Time to watch this serial killer movie. <laughs> yeah. We're about to get the uh, first spoken word of the movie, which is Jesus, when he looks at Scorpio's note. So, so what's your relationship with Clint? Because, like, I, you know, like Clint's my guy. Like, I, like, okay, wh- whatever politics aside, like, as a movie presence, he's like very foundational to me, and I kind of don't even understand movies without him, because yeah, just his westerns meant so much to me as a teenager and. Um, I didn't really get into these movies or his later career uh, until much later in which I decided like, okay, I'm going to dive into, you know, what this guy's all about. And so like, yeah, th- this wasn't like, I didn't grow up with any of these. And like, my dad wasn't, you know, like a huge fan of whatever, like he more preferred the Westerns. So yeah, like o- overall with Eastwood, cause we talked about Don Siegel, like, like, how do you feel about Eastwood as just this, um, I don't know, like the icon that he is, essentially. Well, cards on the table. Um, I the, the first, besides the first Dirty Harry, the first film that really kind of like um, punched hard in my consciousness that I watched from him was Million Dollar Baby in the early 2000s, um, which to, I love to this day. And um, I think yeah, just I kind of, movie. yeah, yeah, the counterpoint of like his like hard-edged, you know, I, I guess you would call like traditional masculinity with like this, um, this sensitivity and melancholy um, in that movie. And kind of like, there's more to meets the eye um, behind the tie cheekbones. Um, I think like, and, and yeah, the juxtaposition of kind of like, you know, the, 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 the ultra violence with like the tender touch um, that, you know, I think that you'll, you see flashes of that in a lot of his movies. Uh, even the ones that aren't um that you know the le- the lesser respected ones um so as an icon he's fascinating and uh you know um it's dirty hairy a million dollar baby for me in a lot of ways <laughs> yeah it's interesting to me how like there's two parts of eastwood in his career there's the there's the part where he just you know is an icon right unabashed and there's the part where he leans more into being a director after the late eighties, where like every movie he makes starts being a critique of himself, not everyone, but like a whole bunch, like, like, you know, uh, even high plains drifter as far back as what? 73, 74, that shit. I mean, it is him like taking apart his cool guy image. Uh, and I've heard the beguiled is also about this too, which he did with Siegel. Like he's so um, it's, it's rare to find um, an actor who's so willing to like take what they do and undermine it and almost make fun of it and not really, uh, I don't, he's not interested in like valorizing himself. And I think when you look at a movie like Gran Torino, like he does this apologia tour in his own movies of saying like, all right, like this thing that like made me famous and whatever, it's actually not this. I'm like, this is my own mm. take on that. And my own, uh, it's like a form of auto critique. Right. And like, I can't think of any other movie star who essentially does this, right? Like, like Tom Cruise isn't really making films about, I mean, like he is, but like he's not only like, very recently. A, he's not making a film about, like even Top Gun, though, it's not like, you know, oh, man, you know, but Maverick isn't a cool dude. Like, he's still a cool dude, right? Just cool in a different way. Whereas Clint yeah. Eastwood, you know, he, he makes movies about like, you know, like 
you know, maverick, uh, you know, vigilantes who are like pricks and, you know, cowboys who are definitely not good people. And like, he's such a, he's so invested in like taking the cynicism of, you know, the spaghetti Western and a movie like this and then pushing it to 11 and saying like, all right, like it's like enough of the aesthetic uh, coolness that, you know, gets invigorated with the, with these movies, right? The spaghetti Westerns and with these crime movies and, you know, mm-hmm. We're just going to strip that away, strip the Leone away, strip the seagull away, and like make it into something. Um, I don't know, like just so much more uh, bare bones and minimalist. Um, speaking of cool, <laughs> so this is like the infamous John Milius scene uh, that I think everyone and their mother knows about because it's been parodied to death. Um, I got to say, like, it's, it's still uh, extremely effective. <laughs> Like yeah. Oh, and you'll notice the marquee here has uh, "Play Misty for Me" on it. That's Eastwood's. Oh, does it? Oh, I I didn't even. You're right. I never noticed that. That's amazing. Yeah, "Play Misty for Me." I believe that's also about him interrogating his image and like, you know, Mm -hmm. like like a famous guy who has like a stalker. Yeah, I mean, um, I was reading a book, uh, "Dirty Harry's America," and we can juxtapose um, his. the the what his interaction with the uh, African American bank robbers here with the uh, the doctor who stitches him up in a later scene, but um, you know he violently suppresses uh you know the bank robbers and um he's uh he's super nice to the like middle class doctor who uh you know plays by the plays by the rules and uh you know pulls the uh well, who is pull, deferential pull <laughs> right yeah exactly well because. Also, the the bank robbers in here, like they're kind of like he's like wearing a beret. There's kind of this aura of like Black Panther militancy. Like it's vague and it's not really developed, but there's something to that where, um, you know, like another movie that's like comes out during this time that has that as well is um, Assault on Precinct 13, right? Where they're all dressed up like, like one of them looks like Che Guevara. Like they there's this idea that like the gang culture has merged with the, the militant culture and they're, you know, indistinguishable and that every uh, act of crime is act of political subversion. And there's mm-hmm. this like, like, you know, <laughs> insane right wing paranoia fucking attitude towards it, which I'm sure um, it, it's hard to know, like how much of this is John Milius and how much of it is before, but it, it definitely feels like him, especially yeah. like the fetishistic gun nonsense that this scene has like oh my god like that like, so many of his <laughs> movies the, the characters i just watched a a mini series he did called the rough riders and he'll just stop the whole fucking thing and talk about like all right this is the springfield rifle and it's like oh my god like he <laughs> just go into like a michael mann level of you know semi-autistic detail <laughs> about firearms and like like on one hand i'm like why but on the other hand i'm like ah. Oh, I like that kind of like weird, like semi process oriented stuff, right? Yeah. You know, it's it's an interesting way to convey a person's psychology by like, you know, focusing on like these objects that they carry with them and that are important to them. Right. And and man, I uh he he just looks so cool being a fascist here. Like, I just gotta say. Um Yeah, you want that to be uh, quoted on your gravestone? I don't know if you do. (laughs) No, no, I just mean it's, uh, you know, uh, when I first watched it, it just cut right through. um, And I was very young when I saw it, obviously. I was still kind of like, my worldview was still... The the images are undeniable, right? Like, like, you know, like if this is a fascist film, and it probably definitely is, like, like this does like the whole fascist aesthetic thing better than the actual fucking Nazis ever did. Because like, they just look like dorks. Like this, you know, like this is designed to be a cinematic, uh, high impact storytelling. Yeah. And I mean, like, uh, why does he need to do this right here? Well, it's, it's just, it's a cinematic moment. Well, it's just cool shit. Like it's, you know, it's stuff that movie characters do. And it's the kind of like, uh, Milius, like, you know, like the idea of guns being such a power trip. I mean, especially in American culture, it's, you know, it's an undercurrent that just never, ever goes away. And so I, what I will say about this movie is that it's one of the few ones to actually own up to it and like not bullshit around and be like, oh, but actually 
uh, Dirty Harry's like, you know, he's kind of a nice guy, you know, underneath it all. It's like, no, he's a prick. <laughs> he's, a, he's a fucking <laughs> yeah. prick. Well, you know, what's interesting is the juxtaposition of this scene because, you know, we, of course, um, Siegel mirrors it at the end with Scorpio. He pulls the same trip on him with, uh, did I fire six shots? Yeah, but and then it's like, like this, he's like so assured of himself and like, it's all like, you know, oh, it's cool and it's slick. And then like in that scene, he's basically out of control. Yeah. So here's the doctor. Okay, so Potrero Hill um, was a uh, a diverse um, San Francisco neighborhood with a lot of uh, immigrants and uh, you know uh, African American community, and so this is kind of like Harry proving his you know working class bona fides. Um, we Potrero boys, Potrero Hill boys, have to stick together. Excuse me, bona fides. <laughs> yeah, bona fides. so I'm told. I've uh, I've never heard that before. Um, okay, so can you tell me something? So like, what I've I've seen this movie, and like uh, Harry Callahan wears um, like a sweater and like a full suit and everything. Is San yeah. Fran is is it like a chilly city? Is it kind of cold? It is. Yeah, it's um it's uh, often overcast. Um, I think filmmakers through time have been wise to you know lean into the fog and kind of like the more at- atmospheric. Um, weather aspects of it but yeah I, I just very much like you go out in layers even in the summer because the uh the temperature can change on a dime okay that makes a lot of sense yeah like obviously in the the winter uh, chicago is you know pretty legendarily bad but like you know like when i go out in the like the spring and autumn you know like i'll wear a hoodie or whatever but like otherwise it's not usually that cold but yeah i was like you know, during the summer, I guess because the cinematography of this movie is so bright and colorful that I always assume like, oh, it's like it's bright outside and there's, you know, the grass is green. So like, why is he wearing a sweater? But yeah, it's obviously a more temperate uh, weather style. So uh, this is photographed by Bruce uh, Sertris. Yeah. I'm not quite sure how to pronounce his name, but man, like that, like one of my favorite cinematographers who goes on to basically become one of eastwood's two cinematographers that he works with throughout his like the two or three like he works with the same people over and over and over again uh kind of like Willie scott where it's like he just picked his guys yeah and it was bruce Sertries, it was uh jack green and it, uh the current one I, I forget but um yeah eastwood like i think he really picked up on the aesthetics of this movie because like the shadows are very very dark here it's you know like there's color and there's brightness, but it's not like like when there's darkness, especially in the later scenes, mm-hmm. you you can barely see anything. Like it's so fucking unbelievably dark. And it's hard to think about a movie made before this that had such darkness in it. And like I just mean like American movies, I suppose, where like it was you know, Technicolor and all this, but it was so like, you know, you would do these this night photography, you know, it's kind of unprecedented. And it reminds me a lot of the night photography in Escape from New York, where you'll just, you know, you'll look um, in the background, it'll just be nothing for miles and miles and miles, and, like, you'll just be like, fuck, like, it really is night. And it's, you know, like, American movies really did avoid that uh, naturalism for a long while. You know, you had noir, but that was, like, stylized lighting and sets and everything. You didn't really get something like this, where, you know, you would look down the street and it'd just be fucking... Like you'd have a couple lights and that's about it. You don't really see that too much. Yeah, I mean, um, there's just such a, a intense naturalism about this movie, and um, you know, I uh, the on location quality of it. Um, you know, my favorite film, Heat, uh, is all uh, on location Los Angeles, and this was uh, certainly like you know a precursor to that approach. Yeah, the the naturalism is a like a, a key point I feel because when I think of new Hollywood movies, I always think about naturalism as an aesthetic quality in most cases, if not all. Like you just have directors who push more and more for you know, getting out of the studio, getting out of the sets, and just you know shooting in real streets with real people. And uh, like Eastwood usually doesn't get considered a part of the new Hollywood, 
but I definitely think he is because he basically started directing around the exact same time as all of them and like he's very different but because he's not like a like a lot of those directors were like so self-conscious and so you know using movies to you know uh, make a commentary about movies but like Eastwood in a way does that as well right like he's made so many westerns that are about the idea of the western you know these uh these movies about the idea of like the the vigilante about heroism Mm -hmm. and so it's interesting that like he essentially took himself and made himself into the like the cinematic object that he was commentating upon in the way that the godfather you know is commentating upon like warner brothers gangster movies and all that shit right and he's a capital a artist or that's how i see eastwood and you can even see like the way and the way he talks about Dirty Harry and the way that those characters of Harry and Eastwood are conflated in his mind with, you know, Harry's just constantly exhausted by the bureaucracy or by like people that don't have any interest uh, or a skill in police work um, kind of getting between him and the object. And I think, you know, Eastwood had uh, that attitude towards uh, the Hollywood uh, establishment that, um, you know, sick all those takes, him. man. He was just like, yeah, yeah one, one and done. Let's get it going, right? Like, <laughs> right. He just I mean, wanted to do his thing. Yeah. It, it's so funny that it's like he became such a, a fixture of Hollywood because he really does have this old, old school attitude of like, all right, rock and roll. Let's fucking go out and like, you know, like we're going to deliver under budget, and under schedule, which almost no one does anymore. And uh, yeah, it's like uh, he's a throwback to those. Um, you know, guys like Michael Curtiz and uh, Raul Walsh, who are just like no nonsense action directors who can, you know, deliver in and on time. And I don't know, like the like it takes a, like you said, artistry of real discipline to get away with that, because you actually have to be good. Like you can't like bullshit your way into having that style, because if you do that shit and you're bad, like you will be crucified in Hollywood. Like if you do like the oh yeah. You know, one take and all right, guys, let's wrap it up like like that. Again, if it's if it's not good, like there's so many films that I've seen where like, yeah, directors just get eaten alive. And like it's a testament to Eastwood's artistry that he's, you know, not only thrived, but like he's made what, like fucking 40 movies at this point that he's directed, which is insane to think about. Um, and he's like probably the most prolific director of his generation, I figure. Right. Like he's got to be who, who else. Right. I mean, Spielberg. What he's made like around thirty-ish movies, right? But I think that's the only guy who's close because the rest of them kind of folded after the nineties in a lot of ways. Right. Well, he's just not. Um, he he's not as precious about it, and um, you know, he's not uh, the Palma like, who's like, oh my, like <laughs> carefully constructed set piece, you know, which I love. Yeah. But like, like the Palma, like he'll he'll make shit that's you know, that's so like, all right, pay attention to this. Like you know, he he wants you to notice the the craft of cinema. Was I think again Eastwood? You know, he goes for that naturalism. He's like, "All right, let's fucking just get in and out." And I think a lot of that is influenced by Siegel, who just, you know, was like a guy who made B movies with Robert Mitchum and, uh, you know, like all these other actors in the fifties and sixties. And then he just came to it. and He was like, "All right, I know what I want. I know how to do it, and let's just get it done." Like, there's nothing. There's no two ways about it. Yeah. Um, Scorpio isn't really assigned a motive. Um, you can see the influence of yeah, Ledger's just, Joker later on. It is interesting how he's like, he's such a, a blank, infuriating cipher in this, where like the movie really wants you to get mad at him because they don't even give him a motivation. Whereas I think nowadays in a lot of movies influenced by this type of movie, like, you know, in like a post seven world, everyone's obsessed with like, why did the killer do this? What is the motivation? Like, you know, tell me about the psychology. Well, you know, what happened? You know, why the killings happened this way? In this movie, like, so we couldn't give less of a fuck. <laughs> it's like, yeah, whatever. He's just a sicko. Like, it's got that real, like, attitude of sneering contempt. Oh, my God. Okay, so look at these fucking, these night scenes. Like, this is Taxi Driver, right? Yeah. This looks like, like, you know, this looks incredible. It's so good. And it's so, like, eye-popping and bright, too. That's what I love is that this isn't, like a, a dull looking movie there's so much color there's so much like bright primary colors that get emphasized and it's so refreshing especially in this era of new hollywood like you actually didn't you had a lot of more um you know dour color palettes like the stuff in the like peck and palm movies right it's very earthy 
this is not earthly, right? This is, mm-hmm. you know, it's it's the it's the urban life, but it's not really like filthy. It's um, yeah. Again, it's just like you you have this like you, you have these neon bright lights and street lights, and then you just have blackness, and that's the total contrast. Yeah, I mean, it captures the unique textures, I feel like, of San Francisco. Uh, I think that's a city that's been up underrepresented in films, um, possibly because it's well, just except difficult for, to get uh, permits there. And... Except for your boy, James Wan, with, uh, was it Malignant? Oh, is that oh, right. Seattle? Am I mixing that up? I don't That might be Seattle, actually. <laughs> that one's on my to-do list. Yeah, yeah. No, but I know they're, like, kind of, like, a misty, foggy city. Yeah, there are, like, many underrepresented cities and film like you know there's ones that are overrepresented like you know new york and la you know like i feel like film goers see them more than any other city in the world i mean tokyo too right it's just, there's a lot of like familiarity with certain environments uh, yeah but some others right and yeah, I mean, like San whenever Francisco's... whenever i see a movie set in chicago i think like okay like i know where that is i know where that is these things are nowhere near each other like i imagine it's how people like when they like when you watch Heat, like you you know brought up, like it's all location stuff. But when people are traveling on a car from point A to point B, you're like, how are you getting here this quickly? Like, <laughs> there's there's a funny, like fast and loose quality that's played through there. Yeah, I mean you know San Francisco is so small, um, but there's so much going on. Um, that I think this film captures that well. So this part is so funny where he thinks he's creeping up on Scorpio and they uh they they, they catch him peeping in the window and he's on like a garbage can. Like like that kind of stuff. I love the goofy sense of humor this has. And a lot of Eastwood movies in general have the goofy sense of humor. Just like these weird gags and like I, I don't know, like like not even dad jokes, just like like a, <laughs> like just jokes that were probably made in the Stone Age. <laughs> just like exceptionally <laughs> offbeat uh jokes that just get made and you're like where is this coming from but i'm kind of glad it's there yeah and and it also i mean it shows harry or at least in the mind of the filmmakers as being kind of a stand-up guy you know because we're gonna see um he gets into a altercation and but he takes his lumps you know he doesn't uh he doesn't haul uh these people in and uh you know no harm no foul according to harry Oh well, you know, you you're just you're just peeking in. Yeah, you get your ass beat. I guess it's all uh, all in a day's work as a detective in San Francisco. You're right, it's not to... like they were trying to rob a bank, you know. Dude, it's so funny how like these all like dude, this gang of guys comes out of nowhere. Adam, I'm like, where do these guys come from? What the fuck? They're like, were they creeping on? Look at them. Look how many guys there. There's a whole fucking bunch of them. Where do these guys? Neighborhood come from? watch. Yeah, I guess so. like. Dude, he was there for like a couple seconds and these guys like just rushed up. Like it's like, are these is this the warriors or these guys a gang? Because <laughs> they basically are. Look at them. That's so funny to me. So so it, like the the phenomenon of Harry's partner, like each one of these movies, like Right, this one's a college boy. Yeah, well it, it's it's so funny to me that like it ends up becoming a trope, I think, because of these movies where it's like, you know, uh, I got retirement next month or, you know, in a couple of days. Or it's got to be like, you know, my wife and kids. And then, like, we see later that he um, he gets put on a commission, basically, and chooses not to uh, get back into the life. And Harry just cycles through all these different partners uh, throughout each and every movie. And he just doesn't really vibe with any of them because they're not as gritty to these streets as he is. Well, right. He was, you know, they weren't born. Uh, they weren't. They weren't taken from the womb hold, holding a forty-four magnum like he was. You know, so they're yeah. just not. They're not oh, suited okay. to it. So, so this scene, this whole scene with the the jumper, so this like got ripped off so much in the the first *Lethal Weapon*, which is like you know a movie that's very influenced by *Dirty Harry*. Have you seen the first *Lethal Weapon*? Ah, uh, you know what? That's a big blind spot for me. I'm aware of them, though. I know that yeah. uh, you know Riggs. Riggs is the crazy guy who wants so to that, kill himself. That's 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 what happens. Is that like this kind of like, you know, he roughhouses him here, um, but where uh, in *Lethal Weapon* one, Riggs basically is like, it's like, all right, you want to jump? Let's fucking do it. Like you know, like he's he's like uh, cajoling him because he knows that there's um like an inflatable. Uh, I don't even know what you call those things, but like there's an inflatable tarp 
underneath them because he's trying to distract him from like knowing that they're putting it underneath them. Uh, and then he's just like, all right, let's jump. And he jumps with him and like a, a saxophone solo plays <laughs> courtesy of Michael Kamen. Um, that's another thing too. The, the score of this, the moody jazzy score. I mean, it's brilliant. so many, so many movies rip this shit off. Like the, again, all the lethal weapon stuff comes from this with the, with the jazzy, like, you know, like that kind of shit. Um, I mean, people don't talk about Lala Schifrin as being one of the great movie composers, but I think he really is because he, he does work for this and uh, Bullet as well. And his best work is probably in the sequel, Magnum Force. So, like, you know, he's like really foundational to the music and the texture of how action movies work and you know, how that functions. Well, right. And there's a cue coming up. Um, and, you know, it, there's it's the same cue that plays when they're exhuming the body of um, one of Scorpio's victims. And then at the end of the film, when he's uh, chucks the badge into the rock quarry, this kind of contemplative. Um, it's basically like the theme for Harry, um, Harry's alienation. And, uh, you know, I think Schifrin really knows how to, like, you know, turn up the heat with the soundtrack and kind of like, you know, get your blood pumping. But he also knows how to go deep. And um, my first in intro to his uh, work was actually in Rush Hour uh, when I saw Rush Hour in theaters um, in the uh, late 90s. Um, he was still uh, still kicking and doing action movie scores. And, uh, you know, he yeah, that's so the insane dragon. to think uh, that it's like, yeah, I do Dirty Harry and then <laughs> 20 years later or whatever, I do Rush Hour. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's an un unfortunate arc, I suppose. Yeah, weird thing is Rush Hour is probably more of a racist movie than this is <laughs> in a strange way. I don't. Yeah. I mean, I mean, <laughs> come, to, come to think of it. Yeah. And Brett Ratner, you know. Uh, yeah. Well, OK. I'll, I'll tell you what. Brett Ratner as a human being is worse than anything that's in this film. <laughs> that's son of a bitch. Fucking OK. I'll say this right now, listener. Like, there will never be a Brett Ratner uh, commentary on this podcast. <laughs> there will never uh, on this channel. <laughs> I will never, ever do that shit. Never Good for ever. you. Like I, I will sooner do a commentary on a Nolan film or a David Fincher movie than I will do a fucking damn Brett Ratner. Give me a break with that guy. <laughs> Dude, like that's a mean punch too. That's like a that's like the one inch punch that some martial artist can do. Where like a guy's yeah. like not even that far away, you just pull back and you just sock him. Like, because there's not even any room to really, because it's not like you know you could fly back and like take the full kinetic force of it. Like you're just stuck and you're just like, Ugh. like it, you get like whiplash from it. It's really fucking gross. Yeah, it's the uh, Beatrix Kiddo punch. You know, he also studied under Pyme. Oh God, yeah. It, I mean, okay. So if you want to talk about Tarantino, and <laughs> I mean. It, it, is there not a more like one of the more essential texts to, to him than this type of movie? Right. Like right. it's like this movie and deliverance and uh, I don't know, like insert whatever Cheng Che movie you want. Like that's like the Tarantino uh, school book right there. I would love to see like a detective movie put through his blender. I don't think he ha he'd have any interest in that, but uh, you know, just to see kind of well, what his finishes I mean are. He could do it. I think, I mean, the, the problem is that those movies are always so um, focused on, like, efficient storytelling, and that's not what Tarantino does at all. Like, he's not interested right. in, like, the point A to point B of plot. He's just interested in writing good scenes. And so, like, a movie like this is actually, like, the detective work is not that much of a focus. Like, it's a lot more about just discrete scenes that happen. It's very episodic in a way, and that's why I like it. That's why I think this movie ugh, is actually really interesting and great is because it's like not it's like efficient storytelling serviced uh in the use of a story that is like about exaggeration and the grotesque and you know it's not about like you know like this is not like a screenwriter brain like movie right like especially with the john milius thing you know he writes cool moments you know when he writes apocalypse now that's an episodic movie as well he's just writing you know, all right, then this happens and this happens. And like, it's not really clear how things go together, but it just flows really well. Yeah. Um, well, this is um, a key scene because, um, you know, the mayor has not been putting his resources into this neighborhood to, um, 
you know, to prevent what Scorpio just did, which is just to snipe a African American boy um, from a vantage point around here. And uh, they 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 intimate that the mayor he he wants to have the appearance of um, I guess of being like non racist, but in actuality, he doesn't give a shit. Definitely seems to be some of what Siegel and Eastwood are trying to convey about, I guess, the liberal establishment, as they would describe it. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. So I'm looking at the Lao Schifrin compositions. This is incredible. The guy does Dirty Harry, Cool Hand Luke, Enter the Dragon, THX 1138, Bullet, Magnum Force. But then he also does all three Rush Hour movies. Dude, I think that... <laughs> He's still alive, dude. Lao Schifrin is like almost a hundred fucking years old. What the hell? How is he still alive, man? Well, yeah, Morricone was working until late in his life, so yeah, of course he was. Yeah, it, so okay, he also did Class of nineteen eighty four, which is an insane movie. Kelly's Heroes, which is also an insane World War Two movie. Uh, my favorite Don Siegel would be Charlie Varick, which is just kick ass. Yeah, he, he did a uh, Hell in the Pacific for John Borman. Tons of great stuff. Black Moon Rising? Come on now. Come on. Uh, the Jackie Chan movie, The Big Brawl. The Hellstorm Chronicle? Fuck. Just nothing but heaters, man. God bless him. Yeah, man. I, I'll have to keep an eye out for a concert one of these days if he ever feels like doing that. Yeah, probably not. Yeah, yeah. Fire up the Hellstorm Chronicle. Let's fucking do it. Yeah. So usually, I'll tell you, I, I tend to hate like the 70s era for fashion and aesthetics as a whole this movie is an exception because i think it just you know again like it's shot beautifully it's composed beautifully but god like the, this era in terms of fashion is so fucking garish and it like you know, <laughs> it, it does like not ruin movies for me but like i'll watch a movie like the conversation and i'll just be like fuck everyone's dressed so bad in this like the suits <laughs> are so bad it's so it's like later seasons movie. of mad men yeah, this is so fucking ugly, dude. Now this scene with the uh, the red and the blue, the the neon sign, like, come on, like this is so. I, I don't know. It feels like a like a the way that's lit. Like, is this not? It feels like a like a Nick Reffin scene or whatever. Just like the use yeah. of bright primary colors where someone is saturated in this like ruby, you know, uh, like this cherry red that just like coats an entire scene. Well, there just wasn't as much that the the film could capture. I mean, you needed to kind of like there needed to be a strong light source in these scenes, and um, why not get stylized with it? And I appreciate the movie taking its time to um, to really become like a cat and mouse between Harry and Scorpio. You know, there's like a kind of gradual circling. Uh, in this uh, part of the film. Well, and there's an interesting concept to where they're very much mirrored with each other, right? Is that, you know, they're like both stalking on rooftops, looking through binoculars and sniper scopes. Like they're deliberately very much cast as these two dueling characters who are to some degree a part of one another and feedback on each other. Yeah, the trailer, the theatrical trailer for Dirty Harry opened with a narrator announcing the film is about a couple of killers, Harry Callahan and a homicidal maniac. The one with the badge is Harry. Yeah, it's like the filmmakers knew what they were doing, right? Like, it's it's very knowing. It's interesting that I just don't think like, you get away with that now. Like, you, like, what was the last movie that, like, really sold itself on that particular kind of edginess? Like, uh, I'm, I'm drawing a blank, really. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. It, it's due to recent events. Um, I think Hollywood is still figuring out what to do with cops. So we'll see some stuff, I'm sure. Um, yeah, God, I'm, I'm sure it'll be uh, extremely sensitive. <laughs> well, somebody, somebody what, like, just needs to have the balls to, uh, you know, just to dive right into it, I guess. 
Yeah, to make a... Oh, you know what? Okay. David Ayer. What is that movie he made? Sabotage with Arnie and like a whole bunch of other dudes. Dude, that's an ugly, hideous movie. That feels like a modern Dirty Harry movie. So gross and just like really mean spirited. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, but but less uh less gross than End of Watch, which was a sort of um, lionized beat cops, and uh, Sabotage was more about yeah, like the underbelly. Um, yeah, Ayer is kind of like the premier voice I feel like for cop cinema in the modern era. Yeah, what's he what's he doing now? Do you know? Because wh- what was the last film he made? He made uh, uh, Bright, right? Isn't right, that the he last did. Thing? Yeah, and then he did the pilot of a, um, of a of a show about a sheriff starring Stephen Dorff the, in like like right before COVID, I think. You know, he was he was working on some TV, and uh, yeah, I'm 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 not sure where he's at now, but um, he's the go-to guy. You know, I I we first heard his name probably. Uh, when he wrote the script for Training Day, yeah, he's a he's an interesting figure. I think, like many filmmakers, him doing the with the Marvel Netflix one two punch kind of fucked his career up a bit. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, yeah, I I would like to see him do yeah some more smaller scale uh, like crime movies like this and like yeah like End of Watch and Training Day again. That would, uh, because he's not like actually that half bad of a director. He's not no. great, but like he's he's pretty decent. I don't know. I, I'd like to I feel like you know he's not you know a master or whatever. But like like guys like him are kind of necessary for a healthy movie going environment. Like yeah, just like let this like maniac dude with like incredibly noxious, ugly politics just you know like give him the reins and <laughs> let's let's see what <laughs> insane nonsense he makes. Well, inevitably, I mean, I think even the most well-meaning filmmakers, um, you know, they get a lot of their, uh, they, they do their research, they write along with cops, they get the point of view of the cops, and they come to befriend the cops. Um, you know, you look at like, you know, David Milch uh, with NYPD Blue, David Simon uh, for um, Homicide and The Wire. Um, and I think whatever, you know, wh- whatever might approximate truth, you know, in storytelling uh, going forward. Yeah, you know, they're just going to have to get their information from other sources. Yeah, I think I think about that a lot with Michael Mann. Well, I love Michael Mann, but like he's worked so closely with, um, you know, like the whatever police department of the city that he's in, or he's worked with like these like ex-military, like Israeli commandos and the FBI and all this shit. And like a part of me is like. Ah, mm. Like, I don't know. Like, I, I don't think he ever really veers into like propaganda. Uh, at least because he, he always portrays it as like a pretty miserable, grueling kind of job that like fucks you up for life. But yeah, like I don't know. I mean, I, I suppose you know since his main characters are almost always the the people on the the outskirts of this. Um, like he's mostly interested in the the tactical knowledge that that field represents, because um, when you watch something like Public Enemies, like that's a movie that like definitely hates the FBI, yeah, <laughs> like just like one hundred percent. Like he directly compares them to fascists in that. But weirdly enough, that movie was also made with the cooperation of the FBI, so I don't quite know what to make of it. Like, well, I, th- I think that's because it's of, of Hoover, and Hoover is it's just so easy to like tie to a certain ethic. In oh, police so you, work. you think it's like a bad apples thing? Um, well, I mean, I just think like I, I think you're right that like man doesn't do it out now out, out and out propaganda, but I think that the premise for many of his char- of, of these characters in law enforcement that he portrays, um, it, you know, they're still operating from a place of um, wanting to wanting to do good, wanting to protect, wanting to throw their bodies uh, in front of you know innocence and. Um, that's just like not seeming to be the case, you know, as we learn more about um, how these uh, individuals operate. Yeah, I think the key thing about that movie in particular is the, uh, you know, like you have the the fussy bureaucrats who can't catch Dillinger. And then you have the um, like the cool ass like cowboy cop played by Stephen Lang, 
who just like rocks him and just gets it done real quick and you know cleans up when everyone else is fucking around. Yeah, <laughs> who's like a magic police officer. Like I love yeah, Stephen yeah. Lang in that movie. Dude, dude Stephen Lang is so good. I, I love him with that shit because he just shows up. And he's like, "What are you doing? Here's what you're doing wrong." Like he's not gonna go do this. Like shut the fuck up. He just <laughs> yeah, dude. I, I mean, when he gets off the train, that's like a shot out of. What's my time in the West or something? It's so yeah, ironic. or like Tombstone. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it does feel like Tombstone. You're right. Yeah. Speaking of um, like similar actors to Eastwood, it's always interesting to me how Kurt Russell, you know, he he does the Eastwood impression for Snake Plissken, right? You know, it uh, like in another lifetime, Kurt Russell could have become the next eastwood and he has very similar libertarianish politics but it never quite happened and i think caressa was a much more um i don't know he's he was interested in like because you know he ghost directed a couple of his movies but he never really wanted to do the director thing he just like you know wanted to really he had like a passion for acting whereas you definitely feel that eastwood's like yeah i will act but also, like, really what I want to do is, you know, I want to direct, right? Like, as soon as he gets some power in Hollywood, he's instantly like, all right, let me direct. Like, let me you know, actually take advantage of this and, and do what I want to do and you know, have my own philosophy of how to create these movies. Yeah, I definitely don't sense that from uh, Russell, though I love him. So, uh, Marianne Deacon, this is the uh, Scorpio's latest victim. Kind of like the most... Uh, the most white girl, white, innocent white girl name possible. Um, and uh, he sent a tooth to the cops. And now Scorpio is sending um, Harry on a wild goose chase to try and, uh, you know, ditch whatever police tale, um, you know, might be helping him. Dude, this is such a classic movie gag. <laughs> All right, played straight down the line, and like it's like, all right, I'm gonna do the exact opposite of that. <laughs> right, like, nothing cute, nothing fancy. He's like, yep, definitely not doing that. All right, the idea is that you know the rules they're they're only going to the rules only exist to constrain you know these talented individuals from um, well, it keeps us back from nailing the bad guys. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> See, this is weird to me, though. Like, he's... Maybe this was different back then. When he's acting like, man, it's it's crazy that a cop should know how to use a knife. And, like, nowadays, I think, like, yeah, Like, they probably, you know... But there is got to be training on that, right? Because, like, if you don't have any other weapon, like, you can't be like, oh, I don't know what to do. Like, you know, what, what is it? There was that uh, that infamous cop training video, Surviving Edged Weapons. You know? There's definitely a, a aspect to that, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, um, a lot of them just mag dump into uh, whatever the threat happens to be. Um, right, like the average uh, Call of Duty player, or, you know, just... Yeah. <laughs> well, right, well the, well, the common theme, you know, these days is, you know, um, and, you know, maybe it's just because of, uh, you know, body cameras and phones, and but, I mean, it's a uh, path of least resistance. You know, like whatever, whatever the officer needs to do to just like eliminate the threat, even non-threats, um, which usually involves, yeah, just shooting a guy a bunch of times. Yeah, that's why they went for the the Beretta and the Glock, right? Where it's like, you know, you got fucking 12 or 18 bullets or whatever in a magazine. Like, you know, even if you're a shit shot, you're probably going to hit something. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> probably yeah. probably shouldn't be what you are. It should be hitting in the first place, but it'll be something. Yeah, all that nonsense you know so like like watching this film in like an era like post ferguson post i don't know like it's like it's terrible to say but it's like there's so much that happens that it's like you know, like you almost lose count of like this or that and like you know who like where this happened who did it to what <sighs> i think um yeah just just seeing this in there you have to wonder, like, for a lot of people, this is just, like, frankly unpalatable. And I don't really blame them at all. Uh, 
you know, I was raised on this level of like violent movies and, and hyper stylish action. And I just like, I'm not going to say I'm comfortable with it, but like, I'm, you know, I, I have an innate appreciation of the aesthetic qualities that go into it, you know, and I can like that despite of the politics. But a lot of people I think now would be like, okay, you know, whatever, I don't care about any of that stuff. Like, this is a fascist movie. And it's, um, I mean, it's difficult, right? Because this isn't, this whole era of movies too. This is not like, uh, what is it, you know, like in the, the 40s and 50s where they could like, the censorship was so strict that, you know, like a lot of any political message, like of any kind was very uh, soft and not necessarily like the most explicit thing. You kind of had to read what you wanted to read into it. Whereas this is like, you know, I mean, you, you can't get more blatant, right? Like as soon as the late 60s and the early 70s happen, everything is on the table. Yeah, and they really did seem to try to put everything on the table with this one. Yeah, I mean, this is also a, almost like a a proto-exploitation film in some ways. Yeah, I mean, it was certainly sold as that. Yeah, it's like the it's like an exploitation film made with, you know, the like a high degree of craft and expertise and um yeah, it's it's weird to think about especially uh because what like Vietnam was happening while this is, you know, being shot and released and I don't know. Like you see how this style of filmmaking got put into things like Rambo and Commando and all those, you know, this 80s like just shoot 'em up fucking, you know, dump the machine gun into everything. Uh it's the the, the legacy of this film is um I feel like, you know, there's a lot more idiotic imitators of it than actual truth successors. But right, well, you know, I would say like look at a film like Thief, right? Thief is not too dissimilar from the aesthetic tonality of this. When you look at the way the shoots night, absolutely. when you look at the, the lights, you know, you look at the way that it photographs the urban environment, not too different really. And I, I don't know, like so it's like both like an incredible positive um again like an aesthetic achievement and it's also it has this this legacy of like you know like giving birth to the you know the the chuck norris like missing an action (laughs) style movies like all that stuff right so it's a complicated legacy well to your earlier point about you know modern audiences finding this palatable or or not um i recently watched uh, all the Die Hard movies um the, the John McClane saga. And um, I think that those are, you know, in their way, kind of like um, more dangerous or destructive, I guess, in their propaganda um, to the extent those things are dangerous or, or, or destructive. Because Harry... Well, it, this yeah. at least, like, has some ob- objectivity on Harry as a character. He never tries to make him... Like, he can be cool, but he's never, like right you know like the movie really yeah leans it knows it's, it's, it's like dangerous yeah it knows that it's ugly you know and or it recognizes his behavior as being kind of like a little beyond the pale um you know uh just unloading the largest handgun he, he can get um in public you know um whereas uh john mcclane is just um he's wherever he happens to be if there's trouble you know he's uh he's first uh he's first through the door um you know well the the bruce willis thing too you see this in the last boy scout as well uh which is yeah another film not too dissimilar from dirty harry but you see this like kind of like middle class father knows best kind of attitude that like you know bruce willis it's like oh you know yeah he's a cop but he's like a schlub so there's this like this like exaltation of you know the like the idea of like the proletarian cop or whatever like they're just you know the the schlubby like oh, i'm just an average guy but i'm also da, da, da. you know it's uh, right it, it's it's like very ideologically complicit in trying to get you on his side which you know like whatever that's what the films are but yeah it, i think the the strangeness of those diehard movies is that like they are so much uh invested in like like the first one right it kind of has this like weird anti-japanese like subtle sentiment 
you know, like like not yeah, like a lot of the eighties stuff. stuff. Yeah, yeah. There's like, oh my god, the Japanese will own us by the end of the decade because we, you know, keep buying their cars and all this shit. And the, the second one uh, has like some weird, like uh, like Val Verde drug war stuff that I don't mm-hmm. quite know too much about. But it's also got like all the pre nine eleven plane explosions and that insanity. But the third one, holy shit, that third one. That third one might as well have been written by Tarantino. <laughs> oh, yeah. Of a lot of the well, Edward stuff. Right. And um, the third movie came out before 9-11, but it might as well have come out the year of, you know, for how much the those tensions were kind of like harvested. Yeah, it's like very much like a, a film that's about New York as a community and as a, like a, a locale for random shit exploding. It, same way in the way like, um, uh, what is it? another uh, san francisco movie the rock right like yes that's a that's an interesting another like pre-9-11 in here movie so um we're gonna see coming up here um you know chico is gonna save harry's ass and kind of prove himself um you know uh it didn't take long for his partner to kind of like uh you know everybody worships eastwood in these movies He's a great runner too. Good stamina. Yeah, not a great puncher though. Like I love Eastwood. <laughs> yeah, I'll like Harrison what, Ford. Yeah. I, I yeah, I always thought his punches were weird. No, well, Harrison Ford is a great puncher in movies. I love him. But but like Clint hit like you'll watch, you know, like go watch uh uh what is it, Every Which Way But Lose or whatever that shit's called. Yeah, the monkey movies. Yeah, you watch the monkey movies like he's throwing some weird punches in there i'm like mm, i don't think clint's ever thrown a punch in his life <laughs> it's just like they, they're very but they're even worse than like the old school western punches that like john wayne would do like that's you know that, that's pretty solid right he's a big guy i'm like all right i can i can buy that the eastwood ones like he does like the it's like a weird like he holds his knuckles out too much and it looks just <laughs> bizarre yeah, I don't know how to describe it really. I'm I'm, I'm a terrible puncher as well, so you know. Uh... Oh, I know you've been into so many fights. So... <laughs> I use my words. I use my words. Man, I just love this shot of the, you know, the the barren cross just emanating out of the darkness. It almost looks like a like a shot from Dune, you know, with the scale of the architecture just like dwarfing. Yeah, that's another interesting thing. Clint's never, never really done a, like a sci-fi movie that I could think of. Never really done that. That's not his thing. He totally skipped out on that, whereas everyone else, like, you know, like the, a lot of the new Hollywood guys really went into that. And he was like, nope, I pass. I think that was a wise choice. I mean, it's not that I wouldn't love to see him in a sci-fi, but like, um, you know, he knew his lane. I remember when I first uh, watched this, just being struck by how um, how unleavened by like any positive qualities Scorpio was. Just um, it, you know, it's rare that well, you get a villain like that. He's not even like it's like he's a monster, but he's also so pathetic. Like the movie hates that he's pathetic. They, they there's an active contempt of like, oh no no, like this guy, like he's he's so he's like a little punk kid or something. There's like a teenage quality to him. Yeah, I mean, he's like, I mean, I don't know, I you know, people have said Harry and Scorpio are the same, you know, it's like as much as we're alike, we're, you know, as much as we're different, we're actually quite alike. And I think he's the opposite in pretty much every respect from uh, Harry. Only, I mean, you know, they both well, like to kill, but they're both essentially teenage fantasies, right? It's the it's the killer who doesn't give a fuck and, you know, just does whatever. And same thing with the cop, right? It's the this idea of like total unilateral mania being expressed by you know like actual like thinking human beings which uh yeah that the scorpio like there's a long long legacy there in regards to especially comic book movies where you just have like you know these these villains who are just like i'm just fucking crazy dude it's you know (laughs) like that kind of stuff i don't know like it's (laughs) 
It works for he this does movie. It, he does it with uh-huh. panache, though. A man like and, uh, Andrew Robinson just knows well, how to play scummy. Oh, no, no. I mean, it's a great performance because it's so effective. But yeah, I just find that whole, like, I don't even know that. Uh, it's like the, the idea of making your antagonist like a loser hasn't really had super long legs, though. Like, like they'll play up the the maniac like crazy, like out of your mind. But a lot of like true crime movies, you know, like a lot of them like to portray, you know, it's like, oh man, this guy's a mastermind. This guy's, you know, he's so fucking smart about everything. He knows everything. Like, I, I don't know. It, it seems like he's kind of <laughs> like Scorpio. This is not dumb, but he's also like reckless and just, you know, all over the place. And like, obviously is like, like he's methodical when he wants to be, but he's subject to impulses. Yeah. And so like, well, I mean, like, oh, go ahead. Oh, um, well, he represents like the counterculture. He's like, you know, kind of like a, a, a fantasy of what the counterculture represented in its darkest moments from the right. Like, 60s. So, like, the, you know, these young kids are losing their minds. They're out here killing. Yeah, that whole like insane shit. There's a part earlier when he's targeting that gay couple that I'm not quite sure what to make of. Like, I, I don't, I, I don't know what you think of that, but like, there's something there. It's like. It's like almost like the yeah, the, you know, the kids are you know they're not only like homicidal, but they're killing their own or like there's some weird reactionary sentiment there. Right. Well, keep it in the closet. I think it, the movie that movie does seem to have that attitude of you know, um, let's not complicate things, you know. And of course, um, there was uh, a lot of um, uh, you know, cops were uh, charging you know gay men in San Francisco at this time with like public you know, public sex indecency tickets. I also think there's the idea that like, oh, these are like easy victims that no one will miss them. Like that's yeah, that's that's a very classic thing when it comes to these serial killer narratives. And unfortunately it's true in real life as well. I mean not that no one will miss them, but like that like the whole like the idea of quote unquote like disposable targets and you know how that's used against sex workers explicitly. Yeah, yeah, and you know we should mention. I don't think we we've talked about the Zodiac Killer. Obviously, a, you know, clearly an inspiration for Scorpio. And uh, Robert Graysmith um, noted that Scorpio, Scorpio's letter to the city authorities are exact copies of the Zodiac's printing and the letters that the real killer sent to the San Francisco Chronicle. So that the, you know, at least in um, in the abstract, you know, uh, they're cribbing a lot from um, real life masterminds, I suppose. If if you call the Zodiac Killer mastermind, yeah. I still don't know if that shit was ever solved. Like, I, I don't, I don't care Never about true crime stuff. Never was. Yeah, like, like that stuff to me. You, because you're watching this movie and like we have so much distance from it, but when you realize that like that stuff was really contemporary when this came out, and that was still an unsolved, you know, thing at the time. It like you know you're talking about like hot off the presses like. Well, right. They just had the Manson murders or the Manson family in L.A. And then they had Altamont, um, where the Hell's Angel killed that um, concert goer. Um, this was in 1969, same year. Um, and then, of course, they shot this in 71. So this is very much like souring of the summer of love kind of movie. Well, yeah, this is the ultimate version of that, right? Where maybe not the ultimate version, but like the first like it's at the idea of like new Hollywood from the inception with movies like this was like you know oh it's not only about uh uh what is it uh easy writers right it's also about the fucking you know like the like the nixonite uh silent majority thing that was popping at the time yeah i uh it's it's just hilarious to me that siegel and eastwood um at least they said at the time that they did not consider the movie political um, well, that's a classic conservative like bullshit thing, though. It's like, you know, no, this is not political. It's just real life. You know, like that. That's a, you know, like how many times have we heard that fucking over the years? Mm-hmm. What's okay? What I don't get though. So I don't. I know Eastwood's like kind of like a weird libertarian. Like his politics are really complicated. Uh, the thing with Siegel though, I don't really know too much about his politics because from the other movies I've seen of him, it's there's not too much. Like, well, he's a lib. I mean, like, and, and from his autobiography, I took this quote. Um, 
When you're in trouble, possibly being mugged, raped, robbed, threatened, who do you call for help? Without hesitation, all members of the police department will risk their lives trying to save yours. So I think, you know, similar to Eastwood, he probably had some ambivalence about it. Yeah, and also he's an older guy coming into, you know, the, the late 60s and early 70s. So, like, he's not, you know, like a spring chicken being like, oh, my God, it's this, you know, this brave new world. He's like, nah, you know, like, I mean, what, what is it? He was an editor on fucking Casablanca. So this is a guy, you know, he's he's more of the, the greatest he's generation around. Than, than, you know, anything that was more contemporary. Well, and I believe, wasn't he the director of Invasion of the Body Snatchers? So he, which yeah, the, had some McCarthy. Ultimate, you know, yeah, the almost ultimate, like, anti-communist paranoia movie. Yeah, I gotta say, that original one is still creepy. Like, yeah. the, the 70s one is good, but that original, original one, like, is still really eerie stuff. There's something about the photography in that one. Like, it's it's almost got this, like, Val Luton-esque quality. Because at least until you see the actual pod people, you just don't know what the fuck is happening. And I remember seeing it as a kid, and I was just like, what is this movie? Like, <laughs> like Because I just <laughs> randomly came across it on TV, and I was like, why is everyone acting so strange? And when the reveal happens, you're like, whoa. The sequence is fantastic at Kizar Stadium. And of course, the, uh, you know, uh, Eastwood's partner there, um, you know, is a little soggy around the midsection, can't quite make it over the fence. Yeah, I mean, th- this is so magnificently staged. Yeah, like really big budget stuff too, taking advantage of the locale and the space, and just like you know, it's just like you didn't. It reminds me of a uh, Point Blank, actually, which I think yeah. does share some DNA with this movie. Like, like Point Blank is also like this really fucking grimy. Um, I'm pretty sure it takes place place in San Francisco. Because I know the book doesn't, but the, I think the movie mostly does. Because he gets out of the rock in the beginning of it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the uh, yeah, the, I would be interested to see like yeah, like a, like a history of San Francisco through the movies that they've been in. Because it seems like in the late sixties and early seventies, with yeah, Point Blank, Bullet, and this, it was like a, a discovery of the city in the movies. You know, it became an object. Yeah. You know, also, there was um. What is it? Vertigo, right? You know, like the right. famous shot from Vertigo. I think that in the popular consciousness, there was, you know, this was where the trouble was happening or, you know, this is, and, and, you know, the kind of San Francisco being associated with radical thought. I'm trying to think of the last film I saw that was in San Fran. I think it was, um, the the second Venom movie was it Let, Let There Be Carnage? <laughs> yeah, yeah, which I loved, but man, like you know, I mean, that's that's how San Francisco is usually handled, which is like they'll get some establishing shots very briefly, and well, then the rest. The, of the it, worst yeah. thing now is that they don't even get a helicopter out there; they just get some fucking drone, which is terrible. Right. I can I tell you, I hate that in modern movies so much because okay, later in this stadium sequence, we'll see the great helicopter pullout shot. Oh yeah, one of the best just, shots in the movie, which just looks astonishing. Now it's like, oh, we just got the drone fly around the loop of the city. And like, it's like, fuck, it's so it looks like shit. It always looks bad. It never, ever looks good. Especially, I hate the shit that horror movies do where like you'll, like, you'll get like the, the, the drone shot. But it'll be looking like right down into the, like the forest or whatever. And it's always like, it just feels like the worst kind of visual cliche. You know, mm-hmm. it, it just doesn't look interesting. I can understand the appeal, you know, like, um, you know, who wouldn't want to get it done easy? But um, yeah, I mean, I think that you lose something in being able to just pop this thing in the air anyway, uh, anywhere. Well, I'm definitely not against using drones. I just think like the specific way they're deployed is often like, yeah, like you said, it's just lazy. It's just used to be like, all right, we'll just pick it up. Yeah, second unit, just get some shots of the city and then we'll go to the studio. It's like, fuck off, dude. That's so bad. I always loved how um, how horribly maimed Scorpio was in this scene. Like, you know, uh, action movies often have a short memory and uh, people take their lumps and then they uh, <laughs> pick themselves up and, uh, you know, there doesn't seem to be any carryover, but he's limping, I think, for the rest of the film. Dude, okay. 
this shit. The the face he makes. Oh my god, look at this. Look look at how good this is. This is so good. <laughs> yeah. This is so good. This is cinema, man. Like you just hear the screams of his fucking pain. And then like it just pans out and you Yeah, dude, this helicopter. Oh my god, it's so good. Look at that. That's see, this is what films can do. This is film artistry. Like Yeah. Yeah. And just, I I love just like the deep reservoir of like, you know, shadow around the stadium. You know, this is like yeah, uh, and then you cut to like the the very blue icy morning. I mean, yeah, yeah. this film is just a, like you know, again for anyone who's like uncomfortable with the subject matter, just put that shit on mute and just watch. Like, you know, look, look mm-hmm. at just look at look at what you're seeing because it, yeah, it doesn't get much better than this in terms of visuals. And some have argued that in you know the the shot pulling away from them coming up here, um, the movie is kind of like not taking Harry's side or it's like flinching, you know, away from, uh, his yeah, torture. There's kind of, I don't know about that. Well, I would say it's almost like a, it's almost like a magnification of what's happening. Like it's just, it goes from being like one particular thing and then uses the space of the, uh, the football field to magnify it by a thousand. Yeah. This, this here is one of my, uh, one of my favorite scenes in the film. I believe that's the Golden Gate, right? Yeah, of course. I mean, you you know more than I do. Yeah, but um, yeah, this is the this is the cost, or this is like, you know, he he failed. Uh, even in in all his uh rule breaking or rule bucking, he failed to uh you know save the victim. Yeah, that's the crazy thing about this movie, is that. Like he doesn't really, like, like he fucking he's like really bad at his job. <laughs> like he's like, like, you know, the whole idea of like I gotta take extreme measures to you know get it done. Like he's just bad. You know what I mean? Like it's not like he doesn't. He's not particularly more effective than anything else going on. And it's like, yeah, th- there's like this weird, um, uh, this like p- sense of pure victory, like you said, with what he does. Where it's like it's more about his own pleasure in yeah. doing what he does than any sort of actual like degree of effectiveness, right? Because it you know like um, hey if you can't uh, if you can't say you know if you can't save anybody then wouldn't it at least feel pretty good that you get to off a guy like Scorpio? Yeah, yeah. It's like you know I know they get my rocks off then you know then not and you know if I'm gonna be ineffective either way then. Yeah, I mean this whole part too. He's like, you know, you're real broken up about a man's rights. Like, <laughs> it's. Uh-huh. I mean, this is like such a like a classic like conservative movie scene. Like, you know, these fucking lawyers and psychologists are getting in the way. You should just fucking nuke the bad guys. Yeah, yeah. They always want him to fill out a report, or it's always about like the paperwork. They're just obsessed with, you well, know, yeah, while there's he's like out a there. libertarian, like, I hate bureaucracy, like, fucking, like, the, you know, the, the weird, like, anti government shit. It's just always so funny to me about conservatism is that it's like, oh, man, you know, like, I want to use the, the, you know, the police against everyone that I dislike, but also, oh, the police is like an organization with bureaucracy, and like, I actually don't want to bother <laughs> with that. Like, it's so self defeating and funny to me. Yeah. But you can see the yeah. dilemma because oh, well, yeah, this whole right this whole thing because like it's like oh my, you know my constitutional rights and like that's another like self defeating thing right it's like oh my god America the Constitution oh it's so important but then it's like you know again as soon as you know there's any deviant walk in the street the Constitution's got to go out the window it's <laughs> 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 I'm sorry it just amuses me yeah. Yeah, the the guy they got here opposite to him kind of reminds me of Harvey Keitel a little bit. Yeah, especially, you know, not to bring back Brett Ratner, but um, when Harvey Keitel played Jack Crawford in Red Dragon, you know, he got to kind of be a guy like this. Oh, shit. That's fuck. I haven't seen that movie. I probably never will because it, it, it's like, it's it doesn't that suck. I don't want. It doesn't suck. Okay. I, 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 I really hope that you're right. <laughs> high, mean, high praise, I know. Yeah. Yeah. I, well, you know, I liked Hannibal, so 
maybe I'll like put it on the trash. Oh yeah, well those Thomas Harris books are just so you know it takes a a lot of effort to mess them up, in my opinion. Yeah, did they, didn't they make like another Hannibal movie that was about him fighting the Nazis or whatever the fuck? Yeah, I haven't watched the film. I wa- I read the book Hannibal Rising, um, but uh, I, I've I've always been curious about the film. Um, it's just that man, I uh, I don't know about that actor portraying Hannibal. Yeah, I have no idea who it is, so I don't know. Yeah, when I think about it, yeah, movies like this and Manhunter and those Hannibal Lecter movies really were like precursors to the whole like modern uh, true crime obsession that is uh, Mm -hmm. unfortunately sweeping this uh, nation. (laughs) Um, Yeah, like not that I'm like you know blaming these or whatever the fuck, but like there is. there's a dark strain of American existence where it's like everyone worships the altar of death and is obsessed with the, the minutia of death and who kills who and how do they do it? How do they get away with it? Like there's a, there's a weird like half aspirational quality to serial killers. Interesting. That, like has existed for like, you know, over the past half century. It's very disturbing to me. Like I'm not like, it's like a thing where like they, they admire the killer, but they both like, they admire the cops as well. And it's like, it's like both copaganda and then also like this, uh, this apologia for, you know, like, Oh my God, but really that killer was the sensitive soul. And they, you know, they, they didn't know what they were doing and all this like weird stuff. Like it's very strange. Well, yeah, well, I mean, I, I, um, I'm put off by it because, you know, it's, it's not like there's, we're saving anybody here. I mean, I think that's been pretty foreclosed. Well, no, like you're, you're, you're dancing on the, the graves of dead people and, you know, like, like renting these documentaries and like feeding into a whole industry that, that really valorizes and celebrates mass murder, which, uh, I don't know. And like, okay, people say like, oh, but you know, you, you watch a bunch of action movies where hundreds of people get killed by Arnold Schwarzenegger and like. Yes, but that's also done in a ridiculous cartoon fashion. Like that shit is like G.I. Joe or whatever, right? That's like, you know, it's just dumb. Whereas all this true crime stuff is really dependent on the aesthetics of like, but this was fucking real, bro. This is really <laughs> down to earth. And like, there's something about that, that like, it's like people's fixations on, you know, based on a true story, even if all that shit is made up. Like, you know, when like you have these killers who almost get treated like real life super villains like the joker right where people are like oh man you know aren't they great and interesting it's like no they suck they're not cool they don't deserve your attention these people are losers yeah i mean i think um this genre um uh, you know what draws scorpio me to it, or... in this movie he, he's a loser right like he's not like he's not Big a time. cool guy <laughs> yeah go on sorry yeah, no, the the, ta- the talented or like the charismatic, um, gifted individuals at the center of the stories, you know, be it Clarice Starling or Will Graham or Harry or Vincent Hanna, um, you know, but they're the exceptions to the rule. I think that's the important thing that um, gets lost on people sometimes is like, uh, you know, the, the, the reason uh, you like that character <laughs> or the reason that, you know, you, you remember them fondly is because you saw they did something in a movie one time, you know, it's... Uh, yeah, well, systems like, are in, built in to real fail. life. In real life, yeah, most of the cops are like you know, like bumbling around, fucking letting people get away with shit, like not filing paperwork, you know, like just not doing their jobs because they suck. And the thing is, even if they were doing their jobs, they would still let this shit slide until it became a pain in the ass for them. So like, there's not there, there's this weird impulse in serial killer narratives to be like, oh my god, why aren't you doing more? Why aren't you doing this? And it's like we it becomes like um. Like the subjectivity transforms into, you know, it goes from why is this happening to like, I want the authority to take care of this for me. It becomes like I implicitly lend you permission to, uh, to go on with this, and I, I want you to, you know, I I want Daddy to to take the steering wheel, and you know, like <laughs> it's so, like there's something really servile and pathetic about it that I I just don't understand. I've never understood it. And I think yeah, a lot well, of people I mean, haven't examined that about themselves when they, you know, like, cause I don't think people are into this stuff for some extremely noxious reason. I think it's a lot of it. It's like unaware, unconscious behavior that gets reinforced by certain narratives because people get thrilled by violence and they're like, well, 
you know, I guess this isn't fine and normal. You know, they don't understand like what it's actually coming from. Right. Well, the, the entire time I've been alive, we've been, in my opinion, we've been looking through the lens the wrong way, like the, this punitive approach to justice. Um, you know, when I think we're realizing that, you know, it's it's social spending, it's um, health care, it's, you know, how to address the, you know, uh, society's ills before you get to the point where you need to send Harry after them with a magnum, you know. Um, well, also, I mean, I, I mean, this movie very much plays into this idea, right, where it reminds me of like a few good men, right, where it's like, you know, you need the mavericks like me, you soft hearted liberals, because... You know, really, at the end of the day, you just want a, a strong man to take care of your problems for you and all that, like, like noxious conservative talking point nonsense. And then, like, like, again, like for someone like me, who's like, like as far away from that as you can imagine, it's like, actually, no, I don't. <laughs> like when I watch A Few Good Men, I'm like, no, like, like, I, you know, I don't need you on that wall. You're just a, a fucking asshole. And the, the difference yeah. is here, though, is that whereas like Scorpio is you know like frankly a caricature of a person Mm -hmm. like in in a way so is harry right like there's there's a there's a comical aspect to this movie that i think is missed out on by a lot of people and in a lot of just again general like crime story narratives where you know the whole idea like the maverick cop who's gonna you know he's gonna do the things that society needs but is you know doesn't want to approve of like that whole shit like it is nowhere near as compelling as I think a lot of people want it to to be. I think a lot of people want to like buy into that shit more than it is because like even like like it, it functionally does nothing. Because e- again, even if you did it, like, all right, we're taking the leash off. You're gonna do what you need to do. Like these guys still suck. They're still not good. <laughs> They're still not good at what they right. do. Like that's a that's the crazy thing to me is that it's like the master is not a master, right? Like. Like, you know, it's like the thing with the fascists, right? The whole bullshit propaganda of like, well, at least they made the trains run on time. No, they didn't. No, it was complete inefficiency. Like it was total nepotism. Like the bureaucracy was a mess. Like they, there's no effectiveness. Like there's not this like weird disavowed idea of like, well, you know, oh my God, this stuff, it's heinous, but at least, oh my God, there's security. No, there's no security. It's complete. Like it's total like you don't know whether you're going to live or die the next day in case like a, you know something gets misfiled or you accidentally piss someone off randomly like you know like, again it's like total uh subjugation and it's not like you know it's never going to be quote unquote directed against the right people like it's, it's such bullshit and i think yeah again because like well this film at least i think kind of understands that on some level I think a lot of modern narratives don't. They're like, oh, well, thank God the police are there to protect us from the, the thousands of serial killers that are roaming the American, you know, wasteland. Like, no, it's, this is not Mad Max. You know, like there's, like, you don't, you don't need a fucking strong man to come save you. It just doesn't exist. Well, right. Well, the, the conservative idea is that, you know, there's just evil. It doesn't come from any place. You know, there's no, um, there's only, yeah, there's no underlying reason. Evil. Yeah. Yeah. And that just, that, that, um, justifies kind of like the meeting out of punishment um in the most like non-discriminate way possible okay so like th- this shot with the the brick building reminds me a lot of antonioni for some reason i don't know why oh yeah maybe it's the architecture and the weather um, oh man a- anytime i see a building in a movie <gasps> it's like an antonioni shot <gasps> oh my god <laughs> yeah i'm such a joke <laughs> Jesus. No, I, well, I mean, I, you know, when you said it, I knew exactly what you were talking about. So you're probably not far off. Yeah, I guess just like the weird staging of like having these characters uh, like have this conversation within uh, this building. Although I, I love this stuff, right? Like I wish more movies did this where it's not just like, OK, we're in some nondescript room and shot reverse shot talking heads like big close ups. Like, why don't we? actually stage a conversation in a cool way using a location and like an interesting perspective like you can't we do that because that's what that just did right like it's like fuck you know it's so simple to me like it doesn't take that much effort and yet so few filmmakers now bother with that shit and it really just like it drives me up the wall because i thought i fucking hate the televisual like 
all right, yeah. we got a two we got a two camera setup and bing bang boom and then we're done. Like fuck, put a bit more effort into that shit because fucking even Don Siegel, like a guy who's renowned for efficient filmmaking, even he did that. Even he was like, yeah, let's 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 flex a little bit here. Let's do something cool. By the way, um, this is Norma Chico's wife, um, and uh, I believe she's the only quote unquote active female character. Um, most of the women in this, they're victims, you know, they're oh, yeah. naked yeah, bodies. They might as well not exist. Um, yeah, and this is also the briefest glimpse we get into Harry's uh, non-professional life. We get, you know, we hear that he had a wife that passed, and you know, he's just, uh, yeah, he's married to the job. Yeah, this is like a scene out of a western or something, like the like it, him trying to pull this shit. The Eastwoods burned. Eastwoods burned in burden. East what's bird? <laughs> God, <laughs> Jesus. Yeah, so I, I want to ask you, like, compared to uh, like this San Francisco, right? Does it look that different from the the one that's out there today that you experienced? Yeah, it looks close enough, um, but I mean, now it's interesting just because of how um, corporatized it's become, like so many other. Uh, urban centers and like it's just been expensive I mean, you know it's gentrified so like um the uh, you know a lot of the kind of like uh i don't know scrubbier more pioneering identity uh of uh late 60s early 70s san francisco i think that's been wiped away in a lot of respects but it's still you know yeah, i mean it's, they're, they're trying to hold on to the vibe yeah the uh I can imagine some like fucking Silicon Valley tech CEO watching this movie and being like, "Oh yeah, we need to bring this back for San Francisco." <laughs> like, <laughs> like that's the beginning of like the the real life RoboCop or whatever. Oh, also, oh yeah. Speaking of a movie that's influenced by this RoboCop, come on, hundred percent. RoboCop is like the like the left wing inversion of this movie. <laughs> yeah, no, that's that's uh, so important to to uh, point out because yeah, it's like. Um... RoboCop is sort of a Dirty Harry parody. Yeah, and think about it, right? As opposed to, you know, a movie about, like, a guy who doesn't follow any of the orders. Like, it's a movie about, a, like, a guy who's literally forced to, like, explicitly be programmed with a set of orders. Yeah, and he's literally a robot, or, you know, I mean, after Murphy uh, is uh, revived. He's a pure robot, whereas Clint Eastwood just has the affect of a robot in this one. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, no, I mean, he's not that robotic. I, I wouldn't say he's like no, stiff but, or whatever, but he's, he, you know, he's he's got more in his capacity for violence. Him. Yeah, yeah. And of course, you know, with Zodiac, one of his threats to San Francisco is he's going to shoot out. Um, he's going to shoot some kids coming off the school bus, so they just have Scorpio um, commandeer a school bus. And oh, dude, that shit's so fucking dark, they, man. <laughs> yeah, no, this is a. I mean, you know, part of what makes. Um, the upcoming scene where Harry jumps off the bridge onto the top of the bus, part of what makes it so powerful is just the, uh, the heinousness of Scorpio doing something like this. Like it's, um, yeah, the uh, immovable object meeting the unstoppable force. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So I got about like, like 10 or some minutes left in this movie. I wanted to like really get your thoughts on, because we you know we talked a lot about like the legacy in terms of like the couple decades afterwards of you know when this came out and like it's again it shouldn't be underestimated how titanic of an impact this was where like it you know this transformed like you know eastwood from just being like oh he's in a couple of interesting westerns to being like all right this guy you know is an american icon uh, forever <laughs> and so when you think about like like your relationship to this movie in 2023 is it just like a guilty pleasure or is it like something that you know you feel is like a historical you know it's it's a historical relic of value or do you think like like does this figure into your like your idea of what your personal canon is of films um or like you know like have you like, like, do you watch this now and you're like, oh, you know, like, I can see, like, why I felt that way in the past, but I feel differently now. Like, yeah, basically, like, like, what are your, you know, what are your overall yeah. thoughts? Well, it's one of the all-time movies about how America thinks of itself. 
or how like you know many individuals living li individuals living here think of themselves simple solutions to complex problems and you know um oh, that's very true isn't it you know um harry uh ultimately you know cannot be constrained by the rules of policing um he like becomes, most police yeah of course but i mean like it's um yeah it's about just kind of like the individual cutting through the swath of nonsense and just like you know it's yeah and i mean at the time everybody recognizes it is we're just bringing the gunslinger into our modern complex era and um and i that that's uh, that's always had an appeal and like yeah i mean and i just like i think it's a really like fucked up movie but kind of brilliantly told um there's like a there's like a primal um effectiveness to it and like i think it says some kind of like poetically true things about um yeah just like how, how we think of ourselves and how um how we treat our people yeah it's more honest in a lot of ways than i think it's uh successors were um, less glossy, less romantic, like very stark. When you talk about like the way that America sees itself, there's such a heritage going from this to the idea of, you know, what superheroes have become in modern pop culture, right? The idea of like, you know, like, you know, Watchmen gets into this, obviously, but like the, the crazy objectivist notion that, you know, oh, well, I shouldn't be burdened by uh you know like due process or democracy or anything and that you know like i know what's best for everyone and so like just get out of my way and let me do what i have to do like you know is this not the the superhero ethos of <laughs> of everything i mean like th there can be again more romanticized more you know quote-unquote positive notions of it but at the end of the day it's uh it's like it's still that you know, American individualist fantasy of like, you know, I stand above the masses and I'm going to, you know, enforce my will upon the world. And, and that's going to be, you know, what's best for everyone. And like, I don't know. It, it's, uh, I mean, because at least with this, again, there's like some imminent questioning within the text of what that is. Whereas in like fucking like, you know, you look at the modern media landscape in Hollywood, there's really no questioning of what that is. You know, there's no more, like you don't have like Batman movies where it's like someone's asking like like okay are you right to be doing this like I mean, you had that a little bit in the Nolan ones but not really and then you know like now it's basically taken as like an implicit assumption of like oh yeah of course of course they should be doing what they're doing because they're you know they enforce the the right and just moral order and they always do the right things and so you know like they, we should just you know, hand over society to these powerful individuals, you know, with strong wills. And like, you know, it's, uh, again, it's a thing about America that never fucking goes away because it's here and it's, you know, it is questioned and it's still here with us. And now it's like taken as being like, oh, that's just normal family entertainment. And it's kind of frightening yeah. where you go from something like this, which is portrayed with a confrontational level of violence to, you know, fucking Ant Man three, where it's like, oh, let's <laughs> let's all laugh at the the funny man growing and shrinking, and you know, like, but it's still like weirdly the same kind of thing, the the same objectivist well, propaganda. Well, right. Well, Batman in particular is interesting. Um, you know, the he's the comic book analog to Harry. Um, and uh, well, yeah, because like the Dark Knight Returns was like Frank Miller taking the like the Dirty Harry Citizen Kane story and you know putting it onto Batman. Right, and I, and I think that there there is an evolution taking place. I mean, like I think you can sense it, like in Matt Reeves' Batman. Like, you know, I can't, I can't just be, uh, I can't just be the guy who goes around punching people um, and tying them up, and for to present that as like the ameliorative um, uh, touch that well, our modern it's, world it's needs. Like, it's like, yes, I need my fascist going around, but as long as he hands me a lollipop. <laughs> when I go to get my money yeah. at the bank, and then you know, like the, there's this idea of like niceness and complicit uh, positivity, where you know it's like, oh, as long as you have good appearances, as long as the optics are good, right? Then then you can get away with whatever, right? Like as, as long as you have good public relations, then then Batman is fine to do whatever he pleases. Right, um, and um, you know, I. Uh, 
as far as like, you know, our superhero obsessed, um, you know, uh, modern media landscape, you know, Batman's the most grounded. So he's the one that's going to be the most tethered to kind of like our, our anxieties. Well, he's the one you kind of have to make political now. You can't make a non-political Batman movie because even if you try, it's just, it's going to crop up because he's been so politicized and like, yeah, again, like you said with the Matt Reeves one, there's this idea of like, oh, you know what the real problem with Batman is? It's not that he goes around beating up people, but it's, it's that he's too scary and that he needs to balance it out with some like, you know, public uh, relief efforts. Or whatever. Right. He needs to have like, like a make it right kind of like build houses. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> he needs to yeah, he needs to donate to charity. And you're like, what? Like, you know, again, and that in the universe of Dirty Harry, that just doesn't exist. So I think we've gone from like, yeah, this like acceptance of violence as being like, you know, terrible and horrible. And like, again, a sort of uh, like a, a radical embracing of that by conservatives by just saying like, yeah, I want, I want the boot heel. I want this. I want that. Now it's like, oh, but I, I want it to be nice. Like, mm-hmm. and I think, yeah, like that's what keeps this movie from actually being, I think, evil to me is that at least again, there's an acknowledgement of, of what's going on, even if it is, you know, like somewhat hyperbolic. Whereas a lot of the modern instances of this in action movies and in superhero movies is so ridden with like the idea of like, you know, oh, it's just a, it's a a few bad apples and, you know, oh, we have to be, you know, we have to be kind and all this stuff. But then like nothing actually has changed from the, the Dirty Harry formula of storytelling. It's just become glossed up and, you know, painted with, uh, with rainbows and stuff. And you're like, I mean, it's kind of depressing to think about if I'm honest. It's just well, right. really grim. And, oh, and I, by the way, it must be said, um, this is the Al Pacino, uh, what a picture gif uh, of Dirty Harry is just the, that image of him silhouetted standing on the bridge and then jumping on top of the school oh, yeah. bus. Yeah, that's um, the one perfect shot. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, but you see the dilemma in terms of like, you know, the, the, the tug of war of ideologies. It's like, um, if we're not going to change the conditions, then what are we talking about here? Do we want to be nice about it or we yeah, want to we, be we, a we dick to, about it? Yeah, it's like we, we, you know, like we either have good aesthetics or <laughs> bad aesthetics, which is like all that American politics essentially comes down to, which is... Uh, aesthetics. Um, it, which is insane. <laughs> which is insane yeah. to think about. Which, again, kind of an interesting way keeps this film ahead of the pack because it it does have good aesthetics for a film like about something that's fundamentally horrible. And so like that, that makes it heads and tails above like the, its successors to where like, you know, they were created sloppily and shoddily. And you yeah. know, this is like, at least this is trying to be like, all right, we're, you know, we're, we're going to make some art out of this, even if it's reprehensible art. Yeah. To Harry's credit, you know, he does save the busload of children. Um, and I appreciate, I think like, you know, uh, by modern standards, a smaller scale of, um, Oh, hundred percent, hundred percent. I, I, that's something I love about this whole scene is that it's not like blown out of proportion and it's not made into some, although I like this, it's not made into like a Buster Keaton esque set piece. Like it does feel naturalistic and like they're in a real place and they're just, like going around taking pockets at each other and it doesn't feel like overly contrived. Yeah, there's some uh there's an interesting like weird subtext in here where like the ending happens in this more um uh like rural underdeveloped part of the, yeah um, more of an old west area. back lot type of thing yeah well yeah it feels like an old west back lot it feels like a like a weird mining town space and so it's almost like to you know to enact justice you know like you need to like there's a there's a primeval uh quality here that like is returned to and yeah man the, the use of the long lens here to like have them in the distance it's mm-hmm. so great it's so good like I don't know, just, yeah, again, uh, Sir Trees and Siegel just know how to shoot the hell out of this. I, like, you know, we just don't have movies that look like this anymore, to be frank. And I don't know if they were super common back in the day, probably not, but, like, fuck, it's so compelling. And the, the juxtaposition's impossible to miss, you know, like, um, 
the uh, the bureaucrats just chilling in their you know uh, you know beautifully furnished office. Um, they would have just let this guy uh, get away with it. Yeah. So. So like with this movie. <sighs> Uh, wait, you said you haven't seen many of the sequels, right? I've only seen um, Magnum Force, the second one, um, and okay. uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to watching all of them. I just, I hear, I've, I've heard, or I know that like the first two are a great, you know, they're unassailable. Yeah, they're, they're a great one-two punch. It, it is interesting as well. We were talking about the, you know, the legacy, how this also starts the like the the action franchise with a billion sequels to it. Because there's like it's like five Dirty Harry movies, which is crazy, and there's basically six, and the sixth one, which is the Rookie, which is like like a parody of Dirty Harry and action movies, and so like it is kind of like an original sin thing, right? Where like this kickstarts it, and then it also kickstarts the like, all right, Hollywood is going to be nothing but you know sequels and sequels and sequels, and you know eventually that gets turns into remakes and reboots and reimaginings and universes and. Like not that there weren't sequels before this, but the like the the Dirty Harry movies really took it to the next level. Where it's like you know you're it's at the end of the eighties and you're still getting these movies, <laughs> and like there's so many things following that example. I don't think it really gets talked about because those these movies don't get seen as a part of that um, that heritage. But it's like yeah, why are there four Lethal Weapon movies? Why are there like um, you know like however many like whatever is it's you know, you really didn't get that in Hollywood before these. And these came around and they were so successful that Clint was just like, yep, let's keep doing them. Just just keep making them, keep pumping them out. And he well, was yeah. just not afraid to do that. That's what tells you that these are primarily, they're about the character. And, you know, it, 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 Harry is Clint Eastwood. Who, who else are you going to get to play the character? Yeah, I mean, that's mutated now into being like, the actor is more disposable. But definitely with these, yeah, it was like very grounded and... um you know the the idea of star power and, and him just flexing on uh like i can you know make these movies every couple of years and they'll make a ton of money and that's like a reliable thing and he had like multiple movies right that you know he had uh you know those those goddamn monkey movies <laughs> and um you know he always had his western so like in a weird way clint was always you know he he was like a retrograde movie star who in a way like that paved the way towards a certain notion of the future in cinema. Um, and we're getting towards the ending here. Uh, so yeah, this is the ending. Yeah. So Pat, uh, dirty Harry. It's been a pleasure. Yeah, it's been great. Um, do you want to leave the audience knowing anything about you? You got anything going on, like a, an account that they can look at or something like that? Well, I have a letterbox uh, that I would appreciate uh, and if, if you uh, like my observations. You know, I've, I'm pretty consistent with uh, writing about film. And so uh, give it a look. Um, follow me on Twitter. Uh, maybe we can put those things in the, uh, the notes somewhere. Yeah. That's and don't, don't, sleep, don't sleep on Comrade uh, Yui's work either. Uh, you know, right. This is my film. channel. This is my oh, channel. Yeah. You don't have to promote well, me. <laughs> well, hey, uh, you know, it deserves reporting, deserves uh, promoting, I mean. Yeah, this is a plug for myself. Um, yeah, I, I, I told Pat to, to give me a plug on my own channel. I, re I really dig your work, man. So, you know, I don't mind saying it. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. But yeah, everyone, that was Dirty Harry. Uh, thanks for listening. And we'll uh, be back with another commentary uh, sometime soon. See ya. Peace.